Choose Linux, episode 12, for June 27th, 2019. Welcome to the show that captures the excitement of discovering Linux. I'm Joe. I'm Drew. And I'm Mel. And here we are for episode 12. And as promised at the end of last episode, there have been a few changes, some new personnel. So, L, you've spent most of your Linux life in the terminal, right? It's been a short one at that, but yep, I've spent the last probably four years behind the terminal. And you have recently decided to spend a bit more time exploring desktop Linux. I can say you guys are a bad influence because I've kind of just transformed permanently over to desktop Linux now. And you tend to favor GNOME, don't you? I do. I'm slowly learning the differences between everything, but it seems like home for me. Yeah, well, Drew, you're also into GNOME as well, aren't you? Uh, Yes, but also the most recent desktop environment that I've been on is usually kind of my favorite. Uh, I have been through the ringer of all of them, just about, at least all the major ones. And you've been using Linux longer than me, like 20 years or something? Thereabouts, yeah. Yeah. I think of you as a Fedora user, but is that fair? I tend to live on Fedora more than most other distros, but I also have a real bad habit of kind of hopping around. Like I, I definitely installed Ubuntu today on my main machine uh, because I wanted to play with something in Ubuntu that I couldn't do in Fedora. So yeah, Fedora mainly, but I'm not scared of using whatever it is that I need to do what I want. All right, well, let's start with something that's Ubuntu-based, and that's Regolith. I saw an article on OMG Ubuntu about this, and I thought, I have to try it out. And it is an Ubuntu-based distro with i3, but it's kind of a customized i3. And it's not just a standalone distro. You can just add a PPA on top of Ubuntu, which makes it really easy to install. So, L, I presume you'd never used i3 before. So what did you think of this? So, no, I have never used it. Honestly, I don't think I'd ever really heard of it either. So once I got it installed, I have to admit, I almost texted you guys and told you I didn't do it right because I couldn't even figure out how to start using it. There was nothing to click on, nothing to pull it up. So it wasn't until I started just randomly playing with the shortcuts that I started getting the idea of what I was supposed to be doing. And I have to say, probably for the first hour of using it, I just kept thinking, why would anyone do this to themselves? (laughs) Yeah, because i3 is a tiling window manager. It's not the usual stacking window manager that we're used to with GNOME, XFCE, Plasma, that sort of thing. I mean, I can understand that to a point because I can understand, you know, using the real estate as best as you can on your machine. But having every transition be keyboard based just wasn't what I was normally used to on the flow. So it seemed so foreign that I couldn't understand how people kind of adapted to it. It took me over an hour to figure out how to close out a window because I couldn't find any documentation on that shortcut. (laughs) (laughs) But Drew, you've used i3 quite extensively before then. I have. I used i3 for probably a year straight. Now, this was on Arch, and I did it with the uh, i3-gnome package in the AUR, which does roughly the same thing that Regolith does, which is uh, creates a GNOME backend to use with i3. And when I stopped using Arch, I stopped using i3 because I couldn't get that magic bit back of having GNOME running in the background under i3 to handle all of the system stuff. And without that, i3 is a much bigger pain in the butt because you have to program in things like keyboard shortcuts for turning up and turning down your volume. You have to create your own notification system. You have to do all of this. Now, when I booted up Regolith, it was right back in that magic spot that I had tried uh, to get to in Ubuntu and in Fedora that I couldn't ever quite land because of the lack of integration with GNOME. So having that backend really made everything work so much better. And honestly, when I said that I, uh, you know, reinstalled Ubuntu earlier today, it's because I wanted to do Regolith on my main desktop, not just my testing laptop, uh, primarily so I could see how it worked with multiple monitors. Pleased to report it works very well. 
Well, it definitely works well with multiple workspaces. That's kind of the whole point of it. And I'm surprised, Elle, that someone who grew up, as it were, in the terminal doesn't appreciate the simplicity of i3 because you can just have multiple terminals exactly where you want them on multiple workspaces or monitors. And it, w- wouldn't it be the perfect kind of distraction-free sysadmin environment? Maybe it's because I've found that in other tools, you know, using things like Terminator pretty much lets me just configure that the way that I want to. I haven't found a single OS yet where I can't just do super key down and up to move around workspaces. So the only alternative was what, super key one, two, three. Yeah. It, there just wasn't enough there to really say, okay, this is so much more different for me that I'm willing to adapt to this new work style. But maybe I'm just stuck in my ways already. <laughs> maybe. So apart from having the GNOME backend stuff where you can configure Wi-Fi and all of that easy stuff, there's a, a nice theme on this as well. But I don't know, Drew, are you not convinced by that theme then? So the theme is the Soul Arc Dark theme, which is solarized version of the Arc Dark theme, which is, you know, crazy popular theme. And you know, I I like the solarized color theme. I wasn't convinced about it being meshed with GTK. But after about an hour, I don't know, it felt much better. And I'm actually starting to kind of gel with it and get used to it and really appreciate it, especially when I found an extension for Firefox that makes it not look horrible. Because compared to standard stock i3, it seems just much nicer on the eyes to me. I would agree with that. Now, the stock i3 blue and black kind of theme isn't bad, but it's very bland. Having, you know, a solarized version is actually kind of nice once you get used to it, especially the way that they've pre-configured i3 blocks as the bar at the bottom. It looks really nice. One thing I noticed, and I don't know if you guys got to play with it, though it gives you the option to change the backgrounds, you can choose whatever you want. It's not going to do it. Yeah, I noticed that as well. Some of the GNOME stuff doesn't work, like trying to minimize windows. And yeah, as you say, trying to change the the desktop background. I tried to get my standard black one and yeah, didn't do it. You have to do that with config files as you would with a standard i3. Did either of you figure out actually how to shut down your machine? I could figure out logout, I could figure out sleep, but shut down, I never got. I had to just go and push the button. Ah, pseudo power off in a terminal, surely. You could do that. The other option is to uh, do your meta shift E to log out and then shut down from the logout screen. Now, in standard i3, there is a command called i3 exit, which will prompt you if you want to shut down, restart, all of that. But that doesn't seem to be included for some reason. That is very strange. But the one thing that I loved about this was the first screen you see when you boot into it has a list of shortcuts on the right-hand side for pretty much everything that you're going to need to do. And so even if your current workspace is full of windows and you can't see it, you can always just jump to the next workspace and then, boom, you've got all the shortcuts that you need right there. I don't know why that isn't just standard in i3 generally. Was that by default on yours? Because when I first loaded in, I had to figure out the actual shortcut to get that to pull up. Oh, that's weird. It was just default for me. It was default for me as well. Well, maybe I did do something wrong on the install, but I promise you it wasn't there. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, I can see why you were confused by this then. Indeed. Did y'all find much documentation? Because I had to go back to that OMG Ubuntu article to find how to, you know, configure everything or how to transition into everything. Well, all the documentation that I needed was right there on the screen. (laughs) As I said, that list of shortcuts just let me start using it. But there wasn't a shortcut to, like, close a window when I'm done with it on that screen. I found it a little lacking myself. I ended up going into the config file and looking at the binds yep. to see what things there were for shutdown window or um, various other commands that weren't included. Well, I was mostly running Firefox on a terminal, and the terminal you can just control D to shut, as you would any terminal. And Firefox had the, the X button to close it, and that seemed to work fine, so I, I didn't need to dig into that. Interesting. So is the point of Regolith to, I guess, combine what I would know is just server side and using the terminal and kind of not rely on the GUI side as much, even though it's a Windows manager? Well, that's kind of the point of a tiling window manager generally is to make it just as simple as possible. 
And the point of Regolith is to add a little bit on top of that to make it a little bit more user-friendly, a little bit nicer to look at. But it seems that they didn't quite win you over there now. I would say user-friendly for a power user, but definitely not for someone who's starting out. Yeah, I think there's definitely a sliding scale here. Now, you said that you mostly used a terminal in Firefox, Joe. I actually tried Snaps and Flatpaks, and I am pleased to report that both of those work perfectly fine, uh, including if you enable the system tray, they will use system tray icons. All right, nice. It sounds like you've really got into this then. How long do you think you're going to end up using it for? Probably longer than I should, but um, <laughs> I, no, I love it. I think it's great. It it i3 to me is kind of the pinnacle of the tiling interfaces you know, versus things like awesome or bspwm or any of those others i3 just has kind of the best base package for what you want to do and configurability on top of it without having to do weird things like programming haskell to you know change your config file so Finding that this actually works with the GNOME backend again, I'm in love here. I feel very at home, and it makes me very happy. So I'll be on this for a while. Well, I'll have you both on XFCE before you know it. Don't you? Uh, don't you worry. But let's move on then to distro hoppers. Now, you may recognize this segment from Linux Unplugged, but we decided to steal it. The idea is we go to DistroWatch, press the random distribution button, and then check out whatever it gives us. And we pressed the random distribution button and it gave us Rosa. Now Rosa is a Russian distribution, which is independent and was originally forked from Mandriva. Now there are different editions of this. They've got some paid for enterprise editions, but there is a free kind of home user version that they call Rosa Fresh. Now, the download page is somewhat in Russian, and Firefox doesn't translate it by default, so I had to kind of guess from a bit of Russian and a bit of English, but they have uh, different editions, again, of that. So you've got what they call KDE4, Plasma 5, LXQ, and XFCE. I, first of all, checked out the KDE4, and I also checked out the Plasma 5, so I think you guys did as well. So what did we think of this then? I really liked it. I started out with the KDE 4 version, and I, I liked the graphics as it transitioned in. I, I'm easily pleased with graphics. It reminded me a lot of the time that I'd used Deepin, where everything was kind of graphical-based, less words. Um, I, I liked the start menu, and everything kind of just pulled up. It seemed really easy to transition into and play around with. I have to say, though, when it came to updating the actual OS, I definitely couldn't figure out which of the icons was going to go for the update right away. So I went to the command line and it was kind of hilarious because I went, okay, well, visually it was Red Hat based, right? So DNF update, that doesn't work. All right. Yum update. Nope. Getting desperate now. App get zipper Pac-Man. And I couldn't figure out how to update it without going out to Twitter and being like, what am I missing? <laughs> Yeah, it's using the old school uh, Mandrake Linux URPMI. I hadn't used it in many, many years, and I had totally forgotten how to use it. I couldn't remember a single command. I had to go look it up. Yeah, now that's the first thing I wanted to do was update this and make sure I had all my security updates and everything. But I couldn't find a way to update it with the GUI because there was the, the software management, but unusually it didn't have and update packages thing. So I, it seems that the only way was the command line. And yeah, I had to just Google it and found it. And it was fairly straightforward to do it. So about 10 minutes in, something does pop up in the GUI and it's two red arrows that if you click on it, will lead you to update. Ah, I was too impatient then. <laughs> yeah, I was too busy trying to figure out and research that originally it just solved itself for me. But did the package updates take forever and a day for anyone else? It wasn't the quickest, I must say, yeah. Yes. On the command line, it was giving me an output of how fast they were transferring, and I don't think I saw it get above 200K. Uh, well, that'll be because it's based in Russia, yes. presumably, and that's quite a long way for you guys. It was a bit quicker for me. But even then, the installation of the updates wasn't, wasn't the fastest. So I just kind of left it going and just read news and stuff. Yeah, same. Yeah, I went and got coffee, came back, decided I was going to go outside for a little bit, got a walk. That's how long it took. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But it was a fairly simple installer. And 
very sane defaults I found. I mean, it feels a little bit old school, but it feels like I could get to work straight away with it. It's not fighting me. For the installer, I have a question for you guys. Did either of you actually use the Rosa Image Writer that it suggested so strongly that we use so the distro wouldn't break on us? No, I just got the ISO and DD'd it on a USB drive as usual. I did the same thing, but I found it really entertaining that there's such a kind of area of the website dedicated to telling you that they have a proprietary utility that you need to use in order to kick this ISO. That is pretty funny. And I did notice that they included that Rosa image writer in the base installation as well. They do actually have a couple of little utility apps that they've written themselves. One is that image writer. The other one is the media player. And then they've got something called Rosa Freeze. Well, the media player... Isn't that just a wrapper on top of mPlayer? It looks that way, but I didn't investigate too far to see exactly what it was. I just know that it looked very old, and uh, that's about it. It seemed to have fairly good pre-installed software generally. It seemed to have pretty much everything I needed, really. Yep, web browser, office suite. What else do you really need by default? I found it comical that it had the HP device manager on there. <laughs> Got to get your printing somehow. <laughs> but on that note, I connected my printer and did print without any trouble. <laughs> so that's a plus for it. That's a big plus. Well, I'm going to have to try this because my printer doesn't work in Ubuntu. So maybe this will be a way to stop having to boot into Windows to print stuff. Or we could just finally go paper free as a society. Yeah, dream on. <laughs> But I had to dig around in the software management application to see if it had, you see my test generally for whether a distro has a good selection of software is YouTube DL and Get iPlayer, both tools for downloading video from iPlayer and YouTube, as you'd expect. And it had them both. And it also had YouTube DL GUI, which was a really simple way you just paste the URL in and that works for iPlayer as well as YouTube. Oh, nice. Does it let you change the settings for the command flags that it's going to run, like to download audio only or anything like that? Yeah, it had a pretty decent set of options, although it was quite simple to use at the same time. So yeah, highly recommended. I had a look for that on Ubuntu actually because it would be handy for, well, just general use. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be in the repos. So that's kind of a win for Rosa over my usual distro. Yeah, for sure. What was quite funny, though, was that the Plasma 5 version looked identical to 4 to me. I actually had to check that I DD'd the right ISO because they, they just seemed to be the same distro. Really? It seemed different to me. Um, it seemed to me the KDE 4 version was more of the deep end style, whereas the Plasma style reminded me of cin Cinnamon. So I don't know, maybe I'm just making connections in my brain, but it just seemed like it was more of having the tile at the bottom, clicking the start menu, going up to what you wanted, instead of being the graphics that the KDE 4 version used. Yeah, the KDE 4 version for me, uh, now I tested this on a... a 1920 by 1080 ThinkPad, and it gave me the Netbook launcher by default. The Plasma version gave me a standard pop-up uh, application chooser, but seeing that Netbook interface brought back a flood of memories from back when I had an actual Netbook running KDE4, it was kind of neat. Oh no, that's interesting. I'm not sure what I was given because I did it on an 11-inch 720p display, so you would think that that would give me the Netbook version, but... For me, the 4 and Plasma 5 version just seemed exactly the same, so maybe it didn't. Okay, well, we all kind of enjoyed our time with Rosa, but let's see what we're going to have next. Let's go to Distro Watch. Let's click the random distribution button. And what have we got? We've got Cubes OS. It is a security-oriented, Fedora-based desktop Linux distribution whose main concept is security by isolation. I have heard of this, I think. I don't think I've tried it or it's been a long time. It's got XFCE desktop, so hmm, that should be interesting. So a few weeks ago, I did an event in London called Fast Talk Live, where a few Linux podcasts from the UK get together and do live shows. And the Ubuntu podcast had a coding challenge. And the challenge was that the three of them had to independently write a game in Bash. And that was all they were allowed to use. And so Mark and Popey, wrote pretty cool text-based games. But then Martin Winpress of Ubuntu Mate fame, he wrote something called Ansi Alien Attack, which is an old-school 80s-style arcade shooter 
and everyone was just amazed. There's a video that we can link to and you'll see the whole crowd just kind of going, wow, I cannot believe this. But obviously he's made it open source and so we were able to check it out and play it. And it was pretty good fun. I just cannot believe that you can make a game like this in Bash. It really is very impressive. I was really blown away by this. Now, I could never get the controller to work, but I did play it a little bit with keyboard controls, and it is a lot of fun. I have to say, I was in a bit of a bad mood that night when I went to play it because I'd been messing with some configuration files and it wasn't working. So I just like, okay, I will go pull down the Git repo and see how this works. And we had a blast. I think that the family and I spent over an hour taking turns trying to figure out how to best play using the keyboard. Um, Because yeah, I had uh, just a last playing it and it really kind of blew my mind that somebody just sat down and wrote this game without lots and lots of planning. Well he did start it around Christmas and it was only a few weeks ago when he revealed it to everyone and I think he said it was like thousands and thousands of lines of code so he did spend quite a long time on it but still it is very impressive. Oh, I thought that he had like sat down at the event and written it. Oh, no, no. They prepared for it months in advance. But it is still very impressive. Now, I don't have a Steam controller or an Xbox controller, but I've got a cheap USB controller that I got for like three or four quid off Amazon. And uh, that didn't work by default. But I found something called Q Joypad, which allowed me to map the buttons And you only need five buttons, really, up, down, left, right, and fire. And so I was able to really simply map those buttons to the keys required. And then I was able to play it with a controller, which was pretty cool. Now, it didn't work as well as a Steam controller because that's what it's designed for. But it was still uh, a fun game to play. Although, if you look at the video, it runs really smoothly on, I think it was Popey's ThinkPad, which is pretty beefy. I tested it on a fairly old i3 laptop and... I don't know, the frame rates weren't great on that. So I think you need to have a reasonably good machine to play this on, which is a bit weird given that it's a, you know, arcade game. But it's written in Bash, what are you going to do? I didn't have any performance problems on my end, but I was running it on a ThinkPad X1 from 2014. That was an i5, and that seemed to do just fine. I did have the game kind of exit out a few times on me where I'm not sure if... I really don't think that we hit any combination of keys that should have caused it to occur, but we just had to kick it back off. Ah, well, Martin explained that on the night, and if you watch the video, you'll see. It's too many keys going into the read command and making that seg fault, and there's not a lot he can do about that at the moment. I'm hoping that this will gather some momentum and someone can optimize it a bit and make that not happen. But yeah, occasionally you just get a bunch of keys, um, you know, a bunch of characters across the screen where you're pressing them, and yeah, the only way to fix it is to start the game again. But it's, uh, you know, it's something that he hacked together. I think you can give him the benefit of the doubt on that. Definitely. I'm just looking forward to snap support. Yeah, he said that he's got it all lined up and he just has to find the time to create a snap for it. Because um, it's a little bit fiddly to install. You have to app get install a few things first and um, then clone the repo and, and run the um, shell script. But it's fairly straightforward now. But yeah, once there's a snap, that'll be amazing. And Joe, weren't you playing this over SSH from your phone at one point? Yeah, well, I just thought for the laws, let's see if this is actually going to work. And sure enough, it did. Yeah. Using Juice SSH on my Android phone, I was able to get into that machine and run it. And it, as you can expect, it didn't run brilliantly, but it did run. And I asked Martin about it and he said that, yeah, he did have that in mind and it would work over a remote connection. So that's pretty cool to be able to SSH in and do it. Well, we'll have links in the show notes, so do check that out. Um, Let's wrap things up with a super quick pro tip. Now, this, I think, is almost enough to get me using GNOME. Not quite, but almost. I had no idea that GNOME has a built-in screen recorder. You don't have to install anything. You just press a few keys, and it starts recording your screen. It's amazing. I've actually used this in the past to some effect for uh, some special projects back when I worked in the MSP field. I had... a particular project where I had some people SSHing into my computer from Taiwan to write a custom firmware for a router. And I wasn't going to stay up all night because I had to work the next morning. Uh, But I did want to see what they were doing in this guest session that I set up for them. 
So I actually just booted into that guest session, set it so that it wouldn't time out, and hit the record button and just let it roll. And to its credit, it rolled all night, saved it as a uh, WebM, and I was able to review it the next day, no problems. It's kind of comical, but I used it before too without realizing it. So when I was looking over it and trying to test it, I went into videos to see, you know, hey, did it record correctly? And there were quite a few other videos there where I must have triggered the hot buttons by accident. So we're lucky that it was only 30 seconds by default or I might have used up my hard drive. (laughs) Well, that is exactly why it's 30 seconds by default, because you could accidentally do it. Control, Alt, Shift, and R. But it is pretty easy to change that default. It's just one command. And we can link to an article that gives all the commands and everything. And you can change that default to a certain number of seconds, or you can just set it to zero, which is just indefinite. But this seems like, L, I know you do a lot of presentations and stuff. This seems like it would be really handy for you, rather than having to install a separate tool. Yeah, especially if I could just put in the audio later, if I didn't have anyone speaking, it would make work a lot easier. There is a drawback, though. If you do have multiple monitors, it really reduces the uh, effectiveness of this tool because it will try to capture everything, which may not be what you want. So if you do have more advanced needs like that, something like OBS is going to be a better shot for you. Oh, yeah, definitely. If you're starting to get into multiple monitors and things, but... If you just want to quickly capture something, it seems absolutely ideal. I did try it on XFCE, kind of crossed my fingers, hoped, but unfortunately, no. Seems to be a GNOME only thing. Right, well, I suppose we'd better get out of here then. If you want to get all the future episodes, go to choose.linux.show slash subscribe. And if you want to get in contact, go to choose.linux.show slash contact. And you can find us on Twitter. I'm at Joe Ressington. I'm at Drew of Doom. And I'm at L underscore O underscore punk at L O punk. We'll be back in two weeks with more exciting discoveries. See you in a couple of weeks. Bye.